My name is Frank Booth and um, for nearly 40 years I was a nurse until I had a catastrophic heart attack. Um, thankfully, um, through to good offices of both ambulance and Victoria Hospital's cardiology, I managed to survive it. One of the difficulties is that when you've had such an event, you will almost inevitably end up with more problems later down the line. I was also diabetic. Over the years, I've managed to develop heart failure. I've had to have a cardiac pacemaker, an ICD, a defibrillator fitted, and my sugars from time to time have become very erratic. So I've had experience in, in both the um, diabetic wards and also in the heart wards. I've also got renal failure. And the nice thing people tell me is, oh, you look very well. Fortunately, looking very well doesn't really actually mean anything because quite often you can feel really quite unwell when you look quite well. My latest experience was on a cardiology ward, which was um, rather unfortunate and I was not a very happy person at the end of that. And so when um, in the last month or two, I've had to come back into hospital again for what is called cardiac decompensation because I fill up with fluid as a result of the heart failure and the kidney failure. I specifically asked, can you accommodate me on Ward 37, which is the cardiology ward? Now, if you look at the various websites that the government hold, it will, you will see a notice there which tells you how terrible this ward is. And in fact, it's just one step away from hell. Now, that's the experience of one person who wrote there. And if I wasn't a particularly uh, experienced person or not interested and not been on this ward before, that would have frightened me. The reality is I specifically asked to go on this ward, which was maybe seen as quite strange, but I had faith in this ward that they would be able to sort me out. And they did. And for every comment that was negative on the government website, I could put in 20 positive comments about this ward because one person found it to be terrible. I couldn't see one example. Uh, one of the examples was the fact that this person had lost seven pounds in weight in, in a fortnight. I'm glad to say I actually lost about 16 pounds in weight in a week, but that was intended. That was part of what I was there for because I was an unintravenous um, diuretics. In some places, uh, the diabetic ward for example, I had a perfectly adequate experience and didn't really have a problem at all. But Ward 37 has given me great faith in cardiology and in this particular ward in itself. Because having experienced this, I now know what can be achieved. I know that I can say that if I go into there to my family, don't worry, I'm safe. I know I'm safe. And if I know I'm safe, I will have a better experience. And that's how I've, how I've arrived to actually try to explain to you today and it, another event which took place on the ward, which I certainly didn't expect, certainly didn't um, imagine would ever happen to me. <clears throat> um, the heart failure that I've got has now become significantly uh, worse. And I've been told that the majority of the drugs that I'm taking now have stopped working. So end of life is um, going to approach sooner rather than later. Now, I actually prefer to be told these things. I'll, I am very keen on black and white. I need to know what's happening to me so that I can take control of my life and make my decisions and not leave it to other people. I've had a conversation with my daughter, who is my next of kin, about the sort of things that nobody wants to talk to the family about, because it's scary and it's upsetting to everybody, but we've had that conversation. And a time will come when I'm hoping that uh, staff on the ward, but whichever ward I'm on at the time, have the courage to actually say to her that I am that ill. She will ask them one question. 
is there any chance of him coming back from this? And the answer really is quite simple in my, my mind, yes or no. If there's a chance, give me the chance. Do what you need to do. But if there really is no chance, then at least afford me dignity. If I'm going to die, no matter what you do, then, you know, look after me, care for me, and give me dignity, and let me go peacefully. Now, with that in mind, um, I, I, and having been told that I was going to refer to the hospice for palliative care, I was asked, is that all right? Well, of course, it's always all right. If nothing else, it passes five minutes in the day because uh, days are very long and nights can be very long as well. And the uh, person came from the palliative care team. Uh, before she came, the doctor explained to me, this is to prepare me for end of life decisions. And the doctor then left me. Very nice doctor, but unfortunately, Having now been sitting there on my own for a few seconds, it just felt as though a huge hole had opened up beneath me. And suddenly I fell through it. And despair is the only word I can come up with that tells me what I felt. I felt empty. I felt alone. I certainly felt frightened. But yet I'm a person who's accepted everything. We've made that decision about what's going to happen to me. I know I'm going to die. And I, I, you know, I, I, do I want to? Of course not. But when it, you're faced with it as a reality, it's shocking. And I must have looked not my normal self. Um, I must have looked not well because a young staff nurse, and I, I, unfortunately I can't remember her name because part of the issues over catastrophic heart attacks is you do have memory loss. Um, and that's what I've got. And even if I know you quite well, I do often forget who you are. And she just came up to the bed and sat on the bed, held my hand, and spoke to me for maybe two minutes. Now, I can't even remember what she said. But whatever she said, it must have made a huge difference. And just that human contact, now I know from my nursing history, you're not allowed to sit on beds, you're not allowed to touch people. But she did both of those, so I suppose in effect she must have been doing something wrong. But for me, it was just the right thing to do. And when she left, only a couple of minutes of her time had been spent, and yet the hole had been sealed underneath me. I was now back up into the world of living, and everything seemed okay. And rather strangely, only 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, a person from the hospice came to see me. Now, by then I was ready for her and she said, you know, I've come to see you about the hospice. And I, I said, uh, oh, right, OK. Can you come back in 10 years? Because I'm not ready yet. I don't want to play. And I think she was a little shocked at that. Um, but I don't want to play. I don't want to die. I want to live. And I want to get the most out of it as I can. And that particular nurse on that particular day with that, two minutes of a time made me bounce back and made me feel that life was worth living and I could live and I had the chance and with that chance I can get on and do something about it which is what I've done the new drug I'm on is it perfect no of course not it lots of drugs give side effects but can I manage it yes of course because I've got to manage it it's not an option do I think it was a good thing the nurse did? Oh yes, because without that, I could have easily slipped down into depression and I could have easily lost the will to live. And losing the will to live is desperate. And I very nearly got to that state. And maybe it was just good luck or good fortune that she was there. Maybe she's a very experienced nurse. Maybe she's very clever and noticed things. But whatever she did, how wonderful it was. Because by doing that, it made such a difference. And now I can say in all honesty, that if I have to go back into War 37 again, which is highly likely, I will go back without any issues at all, without any fears, 
knowing that I will be safe and that all will be well and somebody is going to be there to look after me and make a difference. When I um, first and subsequently went on to War 37, one of the nice things about it is the fact that you're greeted, that you're met, you're actually introduced to a name, which is always nice. Um, my name is some, whatever the person is, and I'm here to look after you today. And that's a good start, because you now know who you're talking to. Um, you will be clerked in, name, rank, serial number, that sort of thing. But it's, it goes much further than that on this ward. And it's not just about filling in forms, it's about talking to you about you. And I was given plenty of time to talk. I normally self-medicate at home on a normal basis and I find it quite simple and straightforward. And therefore going into hospital, if everything's taken away from me, I lose control and I don't like that. I don't like not being in control, not because I'm a control freak, but because I'm used to my own ways and having my medicines at certain times. And over the years, I've found that taking medicines in a certain way doesn't always work for me. And therefore, I will enter into discussion with my heart failure matron or my GP or whoever to say, but can I take it this way? Because this seems to work better for me. And if it's possible and they'll say yes, then that's what I'll do. And then explaining that to others who have never met you before, sometimes can be quite difficult. On 37, and I'm assuming other wards may be the same, um, but it's a lot easier if you're allowed to self-medicate, if you are able. Now, there are lots of people who are not able because they're ill or they're more infirm than I am. And for example, if I was actually very ill, like I was when I had the heart attack, I wouldn't expect to consider self-medicating because I physically couldn't have done it. But now, with heart failure, I'm physically capable of doing it. I just can't do anything quickly. And I'm very short of breath, and um, it's sometimes difficult. But now what I'll, we do, the, we will get my box of medicines, because my box of medicines are actually bigger than the medicine cabinet that's on my locker. So, you know, it's difficult for them to get everything in there. And I have a, a system that runs around my box morning and afternoon and evening and I'm quite he's quite happy to say to them it's this is the one for, these are the morning ones you know and you can check them by all means because that's right but it will make your life easier and they've actually said that to me and it makes their life easier if you've got someone who actually knows what they're taking mm -hmm. because some of the drugs will be quite strange to them and some of the drugs I take one particular drug which is a herbal remedy which is not normally uh, allowed and usable, but with discussion with the pharmacist and then with the doctor on the ward, it was perfectly acceptable because I'm used to taking that drug and that helps with the diabetes. So when you actually go on the ward, somebody will show you around and there are certain silly little things that you take for granted, like where's the toilet? Where's the bathroom? What time are meals? Can you get a mobile phone reception in here? All silly things, but you take for granted every day. But they point them out to you. So they're all simple things, but they just make such a difference. My daughter, who lives in Derbyshire, um, got stuck in traffic coming one day and wasn't able to arrive on time. And she rang the ward and the ward said, well, of course not a problem. And she was allowed to come in officially at the wrong time she didn't stay too long because she was came over and stayed and then when she was over in Blackpool she she came at the normal time but that first visit um, she was allowed to come and see me and it, I was really pleased to see her because that day I wasn't well and you know it's a simple thing the sister says yes of course you can no problem of course, if there's drama going on the ward, if somebody's died, a doctor's rounds or whatever, you might have to wait for a short while, or you might if you're able to go into the day room. But um, it's no drama, it's no problem. Nothing's a problem to them. And they just take everything in the stride. And they make your life tolerable 
because it is intolerable to be ill and in hospital because you just don't want to be there. It's not a nice place to be because it's a hospital. But if you can accept the fact that you're there and you're stuck mm -hmm. there because you've got an illness and you can accept the fact that there is routine and there are systems, then make the most of it. But I think you've got to make the effort as well. There's no point in, in grumbling consistently about everything because everything isn't worthy of grumbling about. Is Ward 37 perfect? Of course not. I don't know any ward and I've had 40 years experience in the NHS. I don't know of any member of staff, doctor, med medical or nurse or chief executive who is perfect. You're not. But we do the best we can. And some of the circumstances and situations are difficult. And they do an excellent job. They make sure that you're cared for, you're clean. In fact, to the point that, have you not had a wash yet? Are you, are you having one? Well, that's fine because it reminds you, because sometimes you forget. And then how can you forget to have a wash? Well, you can, because the day is so long and you don't actually sometimes realise what part of the day you're in. And it's only because a meal arrives that you know it's dinner time or it's tea time. And you, you know, it's difficult to say enjoy, but you can enjoy because you can have banter with other patients and you can have banter with the nurses. And you know, when the doctors come around, they're usually very nice and very polite and quite often will warm the hands before they touch you, which is a very interesting uh, thing because cold hands make you jump. <laughs> okay, I may be forced to go back to Ward 37 again. I think it's inevitable. That's the condition I've got. Well, if I'm that ill that I require your services again, please can I come to you? Because I know that if I come to you, I'll be all right. I know that I'll be safe. I know that you'll look after me. And I know that you are really good staff. The young lass who spoke with me for just those few minutes if you were able to if you real i don't know whether you even realized what you'd done but you made my world a better place and all the stuff on there you you know you all are good and some of you are absolutely exceptional and yet you're doing nothing that i wouldn't expect i don't praise having been a nurse i used to be quite a taskmaster used to be quite hard on people because I expect that excellence is actually minimum standard. You should be doing that. It's not as though you've done anything wonderful. But if I can actually say, thank you, you did a brilliant job, then you've actually gone well above my expectations. And if you want need a bedpan or whatever, 15 times a day, then 15 times a day, you'll get your bedpan. Why? because you need it, because it's part of what they do. And they do it with a smile. And a smile saves thousands of words and it makes you feel better. Because if, if that smile is there, you feel good about it all. And I would, I would honestly just simply like to say, thank you, thank you, thank you, because you make a difference. And you never realize how much of a difference you make. Maybe watching this, you'll realize awkward person who was on your ward, me, actually you made a difference to and you made my life a better place.